And I worry, actually, about all of you. I worry that you are the generation that's being cheated. You're being cheated environmentally. You're being cheated financially. And crucially, you're being cheated artistically. When you talk about the sexualization of music, what you're really talking about is a feat of marketing. You need to understand that this has almost nothing to do with music whatsoever. I feel that the issue is a much, much broader one. I feel that what's really happening right now is that the arts are being crushed under the heels of capitalism, and we're entering an age where artists face a greater struggle than ever before. We have to ask ourselves, what kind of society are we actually becoming? We build these gigantic media streams. You know, we have these omnipresent, relentless digital torrents that flow through our lives. But for a large part, we run pure trash down them. So yes, the sexualization of the music industry is bad for society. I mean, it's really, really disturbing for me to see these young people used as mannequins by marketing men who are greedily eyeing the kind of revenue that the porn industry generates and wondering how they can assimilate that. But as I say, you need to view this in the context of a much broader issue. And my question to you tonight is, how important is your creative life? How important is your connection with the sensuality of music? How important are these environments where real artists flourish that are being destroyed, crushed under the wheels of capitalism? You really need to think about the, this. And I would say that for me, and for my audience, which numbers, I don't know, maybe a million people a week, music is really still a primary source of information and inspiration in our lives. I mean, it deals with the poetic, the political, and the planetary concerns. And I will fight for a platform that mu uh, for music that actually really, really matters, really matters, until my last breath. And that's it. Thank you. The proliferation of sex and sexual desire in the music industry is not a new phenomena because concerns with sex are not new. They have and always will exist. Um, and there's a long history of men displaying ownership of women's bodies in the music industry. Behind the scenes, men own record companies and are producers, and this ownership is often reflected in the lyrics of music. Um, this ownership also cu cuts across genre, so Baby It's Cold Outside by Frank Lesser, which came out in 1994, demonstrates extremely worrying understanding of, con of consent, for example, and rap videos are often uh, held up as examples of instances of male ownership over women's bodies and their sexuality. I'm someone who's very invested in feminism and feminist activism, and it's interesting to look at the ways that men have controlled women's sexuality historically, in ways that are coded and not coded, in ways that are visible and invisible. Men have always been sexual agents. They've been allowed the freedom to explore their sexuality and have documented this in film, poetry, and a number of different art forms. Um, women's sexuality, on the other hand, has always been policed. Ideas of chastity and, vir and virtue held women back from expressing sexual desire. Um, from these notions, we get ideas of virginity and purity. It's why wedding dresses are white. It's why we're still kind of prudish about sex education for girls. Um, there, there have always been kind of coercive attempts to shame or critique women for portrayals of sex or demonstrations of sexual desire. The basis of my argument hinges on the idea that there's a vast difference between sexualization and sexual objectification. There's nothing inherently wrong with exploring sex and sexual desire, especially if you're a woman or non-binary person, especially and especially if um, it's framed in an, in an artistic context. So demonstrating a desire to understand your own body and how it interacts with others in a patriarchal society where historically that right has been withheld from you is a radical act. Um, sexualization itself is radical because it's an individual act. It doesn't require two parties. Sexual objectification, on the other hand, is the removal of someone's agency by turning them into an object for consumption without regard for personality or character or dignity. So sexualization, as it's defined, allowing women to explore their own sexuality um, is not the same as men using women as 
uh, overly sexualized background props. So sexualization of the music industry is, is good for society um, because women reclaiming narratives about sex that have been historically withheld from them poses a fundamental threat to the patriarchal society that we live sexualization, in. Sexualization um, brings sex into a public space, meaning that it's no longer taboo. It forces us to confront issues of sexuality. I think it's also important to take into account that sexualization isn't something that's forced onto every female artist. Arguably one of the um, biggest and most widely recognized singers of our generation, Adele, um, hasn't relied on explicit sexuality in order to garner success. So whilst it's true that like record labels and companies have a lot of bearing on an artist's creative freedom, it's too simplistic to see women as puppets in a patriarchal system. No one is holding system. up porn stars like Sasha Gray as role models. However, women in the music industry, whether that's Taylor Swift with her relatively clean, Im clean image, whether that's Miley Cyrus with her wrecking ball videos, these women become key role models for young women in our society. 11-year-old girls, 10-year-old girls watch these videos, listen to this music, and form their ideas of what is right, what is normal, what is acceptable upon this. Do we want a woman to feel that her value is based solely upon her sexualization, that she has to sexualize her body, her image, that her sole worth comes from her image? Because that is the message that a lot of these videos are sending. A lot of the power still lies with the man. I think at this point, I'm going to bring in Kesha. I'm sure many of you are aware of the Kesha case, whereby her producer, Dr. Luke, Lucas Sebastian Gottwald, has been accused by Kesha of repeatedly over a course of 10 years, drugging and assaulting her. The case that she made was that Dr. Luke had sexually, physically, verbally, and emotionally, and abused Ms. Sebert to the point where Ms. Sebert nearly lost her life. That is a direct result of this industry. The reason she didn't speak out for so long is a direct result of this industry. He had created her image. He owned her image. He was her producer. He was a key part of her marketing team. How can we look at a case like that and ignore its inherent link to the sexualization of the industry and say that it's a good thing for society? My opposition falls into, into three broad areas. Uh, my first, um, the first area is that this motion kind of implies that there is a process of sexualization and that somehow it's getting worse. It's ongoing and it's getting worse. Uh, the second uh, implication in this motion is that the industry as a whole is being sexualized, not just the output of the industry. Um, and the third area that I, I kind of object to is this notion of something being bad for society. I don't, I don't really know what that means. Um, and also the idea that sexualization of, of anything is bad. That's always been quite a nice experience in my, um, in my <laughs> life. Anyway, now there are countless examples of sex driving record sales. In the 50s, we've got Elvis. In the 60s, we've got Beatlemania. We've got the Rolling Stones and that unfortunate incident with Marianne Faithful in the Mars bar. In the 70s, if you don't know about it, Google it, you'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Showing my age. Uh, in the 70s, we've got the, the, the groupie movement, people like Penny Lane. I don't know if anyone's ever read her autobiography. That's an eye-opener. Um, anyone who went near a Top of the Pops presenter in the 70s also. Um, by the 80s, we've got a much slicker operation. Um, we've got a whole industry surrounding pop. Uh, I remember reading smash hits in the 1980s as a small girl um, where they tried to kind of sexualize Frankie Goes to Hollywood for a young teenage girl audience. And how naive I was. I had no idea they were all homosexuals. Um, <laughs> in the 90s, you know, the whole leather cap thing wasn't getting that influence at all. Uh, in the 90s, we've got the boy bands, take that, all of those malarkeys. And, we, and it's still this way today, you know, if you look at people like One Direction, for example. We've got young male bodies presented to appeal to the libidos of young women. I mean, they've even tried it with Ed Sheeran, for God's sake. <laughs> so, 
<coughs> this notion, and I think the, the assumption that's kind of been made a little bit tonight, is that sexualization, we must be talking about women, we must be talking about women's bodies, but that's not what we see. We do see some of that, yes, absolutely, but that's not all we see. We see the sexualization of male bodies for female pleasure. Uh, with, that, with that case hitting the news this week, it does seem that in some cases, yes, this is going on, um, and allegedly with the help of date rape drugs, in, uh, drugs, even in Dr. Luke's case, which is hugely unfortunate. But does that mean that the music industry is being sexualized? No, I, I would actually instead ask, is the sexual harassment of women in the music industry bad for society? And I'd have to say, no, the sexual harassment of women anywhere and everywhere is bad full stop, regardless of the industry it occurs in. And it's this that we need to fight as a whole and not in silos, not to focus on specific cases and specific So I'm going to move beyond the debate it's very easy to have where our side decries Robin Thicke and the other side um, lionizes Nicki Minaj because I think that, that the difference between sexualization and objectification is important if you are the person being sexualized or objectified. But if you are a consumer of that media, that is a distinction which is very easily elided by a capitalist music system, music industry. That doesn't mean that for young women coming into the industry, young men coming into the industry, it doesn't create a huge pressure to do things that you might not otherwise be willing to do. Because you know that if you're not willing to wear that outfit, there's someone else with a pretty voice who probably would. Um, and the fact, we can see that this escalates by the fact that we can see that it's escalated in some areas of the music industry and not others. So for example, folk is not an area in which young women are regularly sexualized. But that's because young women in the folk industry aren't competing with other young women who are willing to do that. Whereas in R&B, for example, if you're not willing to like slut drop in the music video, somebody else will be, and like your cultural power is just not enough. But secondly, and importantly to my argument, even if it is a choice, it's just not a choice that is open to all women. Like, not all women will be equally successful sexualizing themselves in the music industry because society teaches us that some women are sexy and some women aren't. And that's why this isn't a choice that women get to make that is politically neutral and, va and um, valuable only to them because it's not a choice that is open to all women. It's not open to fat women. It's not open to most women of color. It's not open to disabled women. It's not open to women who just don't want to do that, who want to express power in other ways. So I think this has, this has harmful effects on society in general in several ways. Firstly, in terms of the way that young women view their bodies, because sexualization is only empowering if you live in a society that tells you that you're sexy. Sexualization is only empowering if you get to join in and be sexy. But if all you do is see women who don't look like you being talked about in a degrading way by men who wished you looked like those women, that is not an empowering thing. That is a tiring thing. That is a demoralizing, exhausting thing. But crucially, even where we have a body positivist response like Lola wanted to talk about with Nicki Minaj, it's always at the expense of some other group of women. Like when Megan Trainer is singing that, that like chunky women are beautiful, what she says um, is, I'm bringing booty back, go tell those skinny bitches that. It's still women fighting other women um, for the approbation, probably, of men. So that's the gendered aspect of this. But there's also a really, really, really strong racial aspect of this, which I find like, really, truly depressing. Um, because even more than most of the women we see on TV being in the entertainment industry, most of the black men we see on TV are rappers. Um, and certainly the examples of black social mobility, particularly in America, come from rappers. If you can think of anyone black who's come from real poverty and made it to real money, they're almost certainly a rapper, which means that these people have like two sets, uh, these people have power in two directions. Firstly, when this is the image of black masculinity which is portrayed in, in, um, uh, in popular culture, the fact that Kanye's album is like stuffed full of lyrics like, we got this bitch shaking like Parkinson's, or it's too many hoes in this house of sin, there, there, aren't, there aren't like counter narratives about what it means to be a successful black man in the world, which means that some black men are likely to take that up and that's regrettable. But I think more visibly and more obviously is that it like just gives racists the opportunity to say that black people are sexist and that's a bad thing and it's bad for society and we shouldn't let that happen because while like Eminem has cultural power, he doesn't have the same disproportionate cultural power as for example Kanye because Eminem isn't speaking for all white men when he writes lyrics like, um, if she ever tries to leave again, I'm just gonna tie this 
motherfucking bitch would bet and set the house on fire or whatever, right? He's not speaking for white men, he's just speaking for M&Ms because white men get to speak for themselves. But when Kanye says appalling things, everyone's, everyone like, gets up in arms about black culture being sexist, and that's really regrettable because it makes it impossible to have a real argument um, about, for example, the position of black women in society, or even like these structural reasons that might lead to a black culture culture, um, which some people find dis like, distasteful. This resolution suggests that music industry is having some negative form of moral influence upon society corrupting our young minds, confronting us with the obscene, or playing upon our sexual desires for profit. And I propose that none of these things are inherently negative. And I'd like to start broadly with the point of art. And um, I identify not as a musician working in the music industry. I identify as an artist working on planet Earth. The definition of art, according to dictionary.com, <laughs> is... <laughs> An expression of human nature according to our aesthetic principles of what is beautiful, appealing, or of more than ordinary significance. And I think that's so wonderful. An expression of human nature exciting, um, exciting us, um, Freudian slip, inciting us into the creative act. Um, and of course, the ultimate creative act is childbirth or a human lifespan. We are all living, breathing works of art, and we all begin with sex or at least sexual impulse. Um, so sex and art are mutual. Sex and industry are perhaps not so much, but sex and music industry certainly, they, they, they have links. But sex and sexuality in themselves are not inherently, inherently obscene. They're, they're in fact intrinsic and vital expressions of humanity. And in breaking down and, and removing the censorship of sexuality, we are lifting the casting of shame from ourselves and having a more honest relationship with sex. So sexualization is a force for good. Sexualized music and music videos played a vital role in the progression of LGBT and rights. the trouble is that our true instincts are completely at odds with society um, as it stands. And it is society's demonization of our true nature that has harmfully impacted our relationship with the sexual and therefore to each other. And music reminds us of our true nature and transcends this, which is incredible. Um, listening to music reduces testosterone in men and increases it in women, decreasing sexual urges in men and increasing it in women. And make of that what you will, but that's another vital link to music and sexuality.